This is Metro Week. Our top story, attracting the aerospace industry. We'll talk to government officials who say a new road will help draw high-tech business to Tucson. It is a regional vision that will benefit our region. Then we'll ask Raytheon about its future here. Plus, our Journalists Roundtable analyzes the week's news. Welcome to Metro Week. I'm Andrea Kelly. This week, Pima County broke ground on a project to move and rename Hughes Access Road. That's a road that skirts the south side of Raytheon Missile Systems and the airport. Moving the road a half mile south will give Raytheon a larger buffer between traffic and its facilities on the south side of Tucson. It also allows space for the company to expand and helps the Tucson International Airport expand a runway so more airplanes can use the airport more frequently. It has two runways, one which can handle all commercial and National Guard aircraft, and one smaller runway that just can't handle as much traffic. It is narrower and shorter and therefore can't be used by Air National Guard or commercial aircraft. Therefore, we have one full-service, full-strength runway, and when something happens with that runway for maintenance or an aircraft incident, then it shuts us down for those aircraft. So the master plan calls for the moving of what today is a general aviation runway and reconstructing as a full service runway that can be used by all aircraft. That part of the airport master plan can't be completed without the land necessary to expand that smaller runway. The road project uh, protects Raytheon, the community's private largest employer, and it also provides us the ability to exchange land, uh, to give us the extra land we need for the safety buffer for the runway in exchange for the safety buffer for Raytheon. So it's a win-win-win. Pima County officials say moving the road, helping Raytheon and the airport will lead to big picture economic development opportunities for the metro area namely an aerospace manufacturing hub. This discussion really began probably in about 2008 when we started talking with our local uh, businesses uh, at all levels, small, medium, and large. And we said, okay, what can we as a county do to encourage future growth? And one of the things that came out really prevalent in those discussions is that we needed an aerospace and defense park like the one we're talking about, like the, the one that's going to be served in this road, uh, that's going to be here uh, adjoining Raytheon. The economic angle is critical to county officials. In 2014, Pima County Administrator Chuck Huckleberry wrote that providing the space could bring in other aerospace and defense employers. Plans for the road itself go back to conversations Raytheon had with Pima County starting in 2006, when the company said it worried about increasing traffic and space restrictions. Raytheon asked the county to consider moving the road. Four years later, Arizona was in contention when Raytheon looked for a site to build a new missile manufacturing facility. The company chose Huntsville, Alabama, and opened the plant there in 2012. Tucson and Pima County officials openly worried that without some accommodation, Raytheon would continue to find more attractive business sites elsewhere. Valadez, like other local officials, is pleased the road project is underway because it could keep Raytheon employees in the Tucson area. Step one was making sure to, uh, to protect our uh, largest private employer in our region, in Southern Arizona. That was step one. Step two uh, is to further create the Sonoran Corridor, which not only is going to link I-19 to I-10, but also link our major employment centers in our region, as well as create a, uh, a, um, a nexus to become the next logistics center for our region. By logistics, he says he means a connection between the highways, the rail line, and the airport to connect interstate shipping routes to benefit southern Arizona. That's why a second runway at the airport is a big part of the plan. It will provide redundancy, and it will provide added capacity over the future, and it also provides a great deal of operational um, capabilities. It'll reduce the noise to the community because it'll allow the aircraft to be shifted farther away from the neighborhoods and it will allow the Air National Guard um, a lot more flexibility in their operations. So it's, it's a very important feature for our the future of our airport. It's needed today but it's needed for the future and will benefit for many years to come. 
Moving the road one half mile south will cost nearly $13 million, according to the county. It will be one lane in each direction with turn lanes and paved shoulders. The money comes from state and federal sources, the county's main budget, and transportation money from gasoline taxes and vehicle registration fees. When completed, the new road will be called Aerospace Parkway. This project, uh, as I said earlier, is the first step in a much bigger vision. And that vision is not just in District 2, not just the south side of Tucson. It is a regional vision that will benefit our region. During the road project groundbreaking ceremony this week, Zach Ziegler caught up with Raytheon's CEO, Taylor Lawrence. He sought the company's perspective on the aerospace industry in Tucson. We're here at the uh, groundbreaking for this road. Tell me what infrastructure projects like this can do for Raytheon in Tucson. Well, number one, it allows us to grow and that, you know, we, we have, have grown significantly in the decades that we've been here in the Tucson region and we'd like to grow in the future. And what this road movement allows is for a buffer zone so we have the opportunity to grow in the future. It also will give us a, uh, a corridor between our plant here and up at the Science and Technology Park at Rita Road. That's very important for, for connectivity. And hopefully other industries will then come and create a, a very vibrant uh, corridor of airspace uh, industry. And along with this project, we are also going to see a second runway coming in. Uh, do projects like that do anything for, for Raytheon or aerospace companies uh, in general? Is that enticing? Well, anytime we improve our ability to, to uh, get around, get around the globe, we're a global company. So having another runway at TIA, uh, gives us the ability to, to uh, uh, get better uh, and more of, uh, of varied flights uh, around the globe. That's good for us. So it's good for the region, good for the infrastructure that we, we need uh, to uh, operate globally. So one thing that uh, we always hear about with Raytheon is attracting talent. You're always looking for people with a specific skill set. Uh, tell me a bit about how you know municipal governments, as we see here, the county, the city, the state, how they can play a role in helping you attract that talent. Well, anything that they can do to attract other high technology industries is good for the region. Because uh, that, that builds up an infrastructure that then promotes our educational infrastructure. Clearly we need a vibrant and healthy uh, university system, a research system <clears throat> that specializes in key areas that, that we need. Uh, we're, a, we're a technical industry. We need highly trained and qualified workforce. And so all the things that our, our local leaders can do to help promote that's good for us and it's good for the region. Uh, you kind of mentioned higher ed and uh, yeah. also K through 12. Absolutely. Uh, how big of an impact do good schools have on Raytheon's uh, work here? Well, it, they, they have an impact in two ways. One, uh, we want to train the next generation of our workforce. So we found that most students either get hooked on the sciences and math early or they fall out and they're not hooked on them and then they do something else. We need them hooked. So that's why we focus a lot of our attention on the K through 12 and, and really helping a lot of people volunteer to train people and, and, and tell young people, here's why this is so cool and so important for us. That's number one. Number two, we need a good school system. So if we want to attract talent from other regions of the country, they're bringing families here. They want to know that their kids are going to have a good education. So not only do we want to train the kids that are here, but we want to attract talent from other parts of the country. They want to know that there are good schools here that can help train their kids. So both of those things are very, very important for ensuring that we have the right workforce here in Tucson. This project is obviously about the future. Uh, tell me a bit about how Raytheon sees its, its future here in Tucson and uh, possibly its future as kind of an anchor for an aerospace uh, and technology hub in this part of the uh, in this part of the state. Well, our mission, our job, is to make the world a safer place. And if you look around right now, there's a lot going on that's that's not making it safe. So our products are in high demand, and there's a lot of demand around the world. Uh, so we see a lot of opportunity for growth. We see a lot of opportunity to innovate our products, to bring better products to all of our customers, our, our U.S. warfighting customers, their allies. Uh, so there's a lot of real good opportunity to increase the, the, the volume of capabilities that we provide to all of our customers worldwide. Uh, because right now it's, it's a very, very dangerous world and our products are needed. Hi, I'm Lorraine Rivera. Next on Arizona Week, Arizona's legislators work through the night to end the session. Doug Ducey has asked for some 
sanity down here at the legislature. And so far, you know, that has really come to fruition. Uh, we haven't seen the amount of crazy bills lately. Now our journalist roundtable. Joining me in the studio this week are Thelma Grimes of Tucson Local Media, my colleague Zach Ziegler of Arizona Public Media, and Dylan Smith of the Tucson Sentinel. Thanks to you all for coming in. Zach, we've heard so far in the show, everybody we've talked to is hailing this road project as the, the sure thing, the sure bet to keep Raytheon um, in town. How, how true is that or how clear is it that that's the, the kind of silver bullet for this? Well, it is meeting a major need. When you can't expand, you really have to start looking elsewhere to get new facilities. So having that ability to expand, yes, that's a key thing. But the other thing is, once that expansion's there, you need to have people working there. It's kind of funny how that works. And a big key for them is that college-educated talent. I hopped on their website, looked through uh, the jobs that are posted Right now, they have 245 openings in Tucson. 139 have the word engineer in their job title. So they really need that talent level now to also help and come in and fill that gap. Thelma, words from the company. Are we hearing from them that this is enough to keep the company in town? Yeah, I think this has been a long time in coming, and they seem optimistic about this will help in terms of uh, future development, future growth. Uh, Dr. Taylor talked about, you know, connecting to the U of A Tech Park and that kind of thing. So I think it's a good sign in that direction. And Dylan, broadening this out beyond just Raytheon, but other aerospace companies, is this the keystone needed to finalize that area so other aerospace industries can move in? Well, to use a little bit of business buzzword, you know, the synergy that's possible with tying together Raytheon on the south side with the tech park on the southeast side and the port of Tucson and making that uh, you know, a, a more accessible between those two areas, I, I think will go uh, perhaps not a long way, but part of the way into uh, sparking a little bit more uh, businesses coming in there. Well, yeah, and it could also be that uh, possibility, like it said in there, that you know, one expansion went to Alabama. So now that this stuff is there, to you know, serve a possible expansion, maybe they won't look as further next time. That's what I was going to ask. What else the company might need in addition to this roadway? We're calling the the county and city are calling this kind of the thing that was necessary. But tax incentives, education improvements, um, cha other changes in local government, maybe better local marketing campaigns. What else are you guys hearing that is necessary? Well, that that expansion that went to Alabama that Raytheon did a few years back was really driven by a, a lot of the tax incentives and the really giveaways they got from that state and 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 from the uh, local governments there that we weren't in a position to do here you know now that that area is in the city i don't i don't believe it was at, at that point you know, right. the, the city can leverage a, a few more tax incentive projects to if, if they were to make a pitch to expand here we have a little bit more wiggle room to make a deal i think another aspect to consider too and dr taylor said it earlier this year at a chamber event is also how our state legislatures are behaving and how businesses who are looking to expand look at that. You gotta look at discriminatory bills that you know may make a business not wanna come here or things like that. That's been alluded to, especially our education system as well. Yeah, that, that is definitely a big issue is education for, for things right now. Uh, just like Dr. Lawrence did say, you have to attract these people and they have to look at the area and say, I like it. I see the things that I like. I can get around town easy. My kids can get a good education. My spouse will be happy here. You have to make sure that people want to move to Tucson because everyone's looking to hire engineers all over the country right now. Thelma, Inside Tucson Business this week is covering another angle, another iteration of the progress of downtown Tucson. And you wrote about a group of leaders, uh, development leaders and, and Tucson um, leadership that gathered to talk about the progress of downtown. Why did they gather here? Who were they? Why were they here? Um, Arizona Forward is kind of a state agency and they, they kind of travel around, they hold quarterly meetings and they chose Tucson for this recent meeting and they, they decided since downtown has been a talk here, they thought they'll pull together a panel that can talk specifically about where Tucson is headed there. So they pulled together, you know, uh, Arthur Nelson from U of A and uh, someone from uh, downtown Tucson as well as um, Mr. McCuster from uh, Rio Nuevo Project who is also the CEO of Symphonia. Healthcare, which is located downtown. And what they wanted to talk about specifically is where do we need to go and where are we right now? What did they highlight? A lot of the highlights centered around the streetcar and how um, this is one of the best, uh, you know, they said expenditures for taxpayer dollars in years and how the success of that 
businesses are coming in. They want to be along that route. They want to come in and they want to keep that up. And that means maybe future development um, for hotels, which are already in, in transition and that kind of thing. So they, I think it was optimism really is what they highlighted. Another thing that you noted in the story was that the entrepreneurs who are coming to the downtown area are trending younger on the scale of the people who typically are, are doing that kind of work toward 40 years old. Uh, any indication as to why that is? More and more discussions when it comes to the economy are turning into that millennial generation and they're a little different. They don't, you know, they want to start up their own firms. They want to, you know, they want to be inventors. They want their own business. So that also means they don't need huge office spaces. They don't need a lot of that startup cost. So they're renting office buildings and they're renting apartments downtown. And so that is um, that is one angle that Tucson's looking to attract the most even more. They don't need the stadium or the TCC as the main anchor. Now they're going to look for that younger generation to come in and stabilize it. And some of those lifestyle questions we've talked about on this show before. Mm -hmm. Now, another thing we've talked about on the show is the streetcar and how much development it has brought downtown. Did they address any uh, talk at all about the long-term viability or the ability of the streetcar to have a long-term economic development impact as opposed to short-term? They didn't talk about it so much uh, long-term in terms of, they talked more about how that short-term short, short -term effect has been huge so far, the you know restaurants and all of the businesses that have opened. And they say that if they keep going in this direction, the streetcar will be the main driver to make downtown a flourishing success in the future. And Arthur Nelson pointed out that, you know, one to two of your percent of your total population should be living downtown in Tucson to do that needs grocery stores, hotels, more apartments, more housing, and that's where Tucson needs to go. You know, whether you're looking at a road for Raytheon or the streetcar downtown, these sorts of infrastructure projects are really long-term bets, so it's a little too soon to tell whether, say, the streetcar is a success or not. We're already starting to see some turnover in the restaurants and, uh, you know, things are sort of shaking themselves out and off of that, you know, first burst of enthusiasm. So it's, it's going to take some time yet that I don't think we can just, you know, put the stamp of approval on that project yet. And I agree with that, especially in Tucson. You know, the optimism is there, but we have to keep it going. Could be one of those things that people just kind of do have that initial, oh, it's great, I can hop on this and ride it. To where? All of a sudden, it doesn't become very, <laughs> maybe it's not very functional in their in their life. And that is ultimately going to be the thing is it needs to serve a purpose to get people riding. With that said, I was going to say one of the things to consider, too, is the population that's increasing that no longer use cars. They use bikes, they walk, and they use those streetcars. So that population is also increasing, and Tucson's probably going to see that as well. That would lead to a successful streetcar project. And Thelma, any things that the, that group of people said are still on the to-do list for downtown? You mentioned um, grocery stores, for example. Yeah, the to-do list, um, from what was said, there's still the potential of $2.6 billion in build-out. So, you know, there's plenty of to-do to downtown. <laughs> Dylan, we've spoken in, in previous weeks on this show about the possibilities that the Tucson City Charter could have some changes going to voters on the ballot in the, in the fall. And the City Charter change, I'm sorry, Charter Review Committee just made a recommendation to the City Council. So now that will be in City Council's hands. What came of that? What were the recommendations that that committee forwarded? Well, the committee basically kicked the can down the road on the most high-profile suggestion, which was to change our election system in, in the city to be ward only. They deadlocked on that with a 7-7 a vote and then uh, voted uh, narrowly to recommend to the council that they have another committee take another look at this over a longer term, not for this, you know, this year's election, but in two years to see if there's you know, uh, really a, a change that should be made and to figure out all the variables that go into that. There are repercussions of the city's public finance system for elections and a, a whole bunch of things where you can't just, you know, change that in the matter of a couple of months. One of the uh, really uh, more substantial recommendations that they put forth was to change the ability, the city's ability to raise money, to uh, pledge sales taxes towards bonds, to uh, change the limit on uh, sales taxes to uh, let the city council vote to raise that and then send it to voters for approval and uh, so, some other changes around bonding that really uh, would give the city a lot more flexibility in, in raising and spending money. But uh, some critics are saying it might uh, really kind of uh, put us out there a little bit too much over the edge and give a little bit too much power to the council. 
Is it clear at all whether those proposals could actually change the budget situation for future years? There's been a continued deficit every year that they have to close. Well, they could, uh, you know, more readily raise uh, sales taxes and, and more readily spend them as well. So that kind of remains to be seen. And all these recommendations from the committee are not binding. The council can take them, leave them, do something else entirely. That all kind of depends on what they do before the uh, deadline in July to put something on the November ballot. The thing I found interesting on the charter part, going back to that, when they um, deadlocked, that means two years down the road or even longer. I mean, you have some wards where Shirley Scott, Paul Cunningham didn't even win in their own wards, but overall won. How was that talked about among this committee? Did they stress the importance of looking at that? Well, that's part of it. And, you know, some people, uh, proponents of our current system feel that uh, having a general election citywide makes those council members responsible for the city as a whole and responsive to the city as a whole rather than being very narrowly and par parochially focused just on their ward and only listening to those voters. And uh, people who don't like our current system, which is mainly Republicans who feel like they've been shut out recently, want to go to ward only because even though Democrats outnumber Republicans on the east side, they turn out, uh, Republicans turn out in much greater numbers there and give them, they think, a better chance at at least having some representation. And, and having a city council that's not seven Democrats, yeah. but having some political diversity on the Of course, council. what that would do if they, we went to that sort of system, given the current boundaries, would to guarantee that the Republicans would always be in the minority. Because there's no way any of the other wards would, if we had ward-only elections, vote for a Republican. The last time a Republican went onto the city council, he lost his ward, but won because of the citywide vote, when Steve Kazachek ran as a Republican initially. How does this compare to like other metro cities and stuff like that? The, the number of cities around the country that have this sort of mixed system that we do, it's, it's, it's rare. And it, it really kind of stems back all the way to our, the, the city's founding of trying to set up lots of checks and balances. It's why we have had the sort of you know, uh, divided power amongst the city manager and the mayor, which is another one of the recommendations that they made was to slightly increase the power of the mayor to give that uh, person a vote on everything and have them count towards a quorum. Right now that doesn't happen. So people think that the mayor is uh, more powerful than he really is at the moment. And Dylan, you mentioned a timeline. The city council has to make this decision about whether to send anything to the ballot, and if so, what goes to the ballot by July. Yeah, early July. And that would be the November ballot, not the August primary. Exactly. Uh, Thelma, speaking of other city elections, uh, we continue to talk about the situation in Oro Valley. Some residents there are unhappy with the city council's decision to purchase a portion of the um, El Conquistador Country Club, and they're working on a recall campaign of four of the council members, or three council members and the mayor. What's the update on that? The Oro Valley situation continues. Um, the last update I saw from uh, the group that's the citizens that are looking to recall four council members is they think they're close to collecting those uh, the amount they need by April 27th, and they think that they can send all four to the to the recall election. And then on a side note, the tooth group that took in the referendum to try to overturn the El Conquistador purchase through a special election, they went ahead and applied to the Supreme Court to have their case looked at. So it's at another level, which we don't have an answer on that level either. So how do those compete? If this recall goes to the ballot, the, the Supreme Court has a separate consideration about whether the purchase is valid. Yeah. So the Supreme Court would look at whether that resolution versus serial number on that uh, referendum petition should be thrown out or held up the way the city uh, threw out the petitions. So they would decide that. And then on the other side, the recall efforts still move forward. And that, like I said, the date deadline for that is April 27th. So we could see council member recalls on a ballot. We could see a public vote about whether to actually reconsider the purchase of that land. Right. We could see one or the other. We could see both or none. Right. Okay, in the next <laughs> That's accurate. time this year? <laughs> I have no idea. Long running it's process. It's going to keep going. We'll keep talking about it. <laughs> Zach, I also want to touch on another important topic this week, which is that the legislature has finished its session. They adjourned last night or this morning, early this morning, and wrapped up a lot of bills, left some things undone. And um, I just wanted to hit on the fact that some bills that Governor Ducey was pushing um, haven't made it through the process. So some of the things he wanted to see did not get done. I'm wondering if there's any way we can link that with, um, actually, let's sp talk specifically about Common Core. Uh, that is a bill, he had initially talked about opposition to Common Core. He has since said 
that he thinks the state should review the Common Core standards without totally throwing them out. And then there was a bill that would have thrown out those standards, this, uh, new education standards in the state, and that died. What can we read into that? Uh, you know, it seems that uh, maybe Doug Ducey got his way. He was threatening or, or at least talking about a veto on this. And he, there were uh, four, basically four Republicans who crossed over and voted with the Democrats to say, okay, let's hold on to Common Core for now. Uh, Ducey has said he would rather a revamp. The, the best analogy I've heard thrown around the newsroom here is, you know, the house that is Common Core, he initially was talking about bulldozing it, then realized, well, maybe it's better to have a roof over my head and do a little interior remodeling. Uh, that's kind of what it seems like he is now lobbying for uh, as far as legislation. There were three different bills just in this session alone that talked about removing Common Core, and all three of them ended up uh, falling apart and dying in the Senate. But at the same time with education this year, they did away with AIMS. They did away with the, you know, read and go on after third grade. And, you know, I talked to some specific teachers who kind of said, we're not quite sure how to measure the standards this year and what that means to, say, pass a child to the next level. And they said some of the state's tests that they did, they are taking this April, they won't even get those results till summertime. It's, so. it's kind of a, a moving bar right now, but the big thing is they did pump a lot of money into putting the Common Core in place. And so they don't seem to want to basically have put that money in and have to just have called it a complete waste. It really seems like the kerfuffle about Common Core is mainly symbolic. If we were to review the state standards, it would go to the State Board of Education and a majority of the folks who sit on that board are proponents of Common Core. They already so they, approved it. They, they, they would say, okay, we reviewed it and here are our new standards, which would probably be Common Core over again with another name. We already have another name for Common Core in Arizona. What is the, the State College Readiness Standards? Something College like and that. Career Ready that, Standards, that. I think, <laughs> yes. which is the same standards just by a different name. And we just, we just you know, labeled it something else and we would probably do that again if that sort of thing were to play out. Dylan, what does this mean for the prospects of some of those Republican representatives and senators um, who did also run on repealing Common Core? Does, we're 18 months out from next election, but is there an implication here? I think that most state legislators are in such safe districts that uh, playing to their base is the right strategy. And, uh, you know, most people will have forgotten about anything in 18 months when the next, they're next up for election. That's just, you know. There will be something new to happen. Exactly. There will have been something that, you know, rose up in the last three weeks to attract everyone's attention. But as far as the people who do pay attention, you know, if you're in a safe district, you, you play to your base. And if that's what you're going on, if that's what you ran on was opposition to Common Core, you know, you're probably uh, doing the right thing and casting that vote, even if ultimately it might have been irrelevant. And you, they did have multiple chances to cast a vote and say, oh, look, I'm, they can posture now and say, I voted against it. It wasn't me that held us back from repealing it. Here's my voting record. Look at it. So it kind of gives them a chance to, to play that game if need be. Dylan, can we read anything into yet the relationship between the governor and the Republican leadership in the House and Senate? Are they... Are they getting along? Are they totally adverse to each other? We've seen kind of, I think, signs of either. I think it's still sort of uh, shaking itself out. You know, there are uh, certainly legislators who are willing to be a whole lot more right wing than Doug Ducey is at this point, who, you know, he's uh, made some a bit more centrist business oriented decisions, especially around Common Core, which is something that's very much favored by the business community. So, I mean, there will be areas of uh, agreement and uh, certainly areas of disagreement. He vetoed some bills that uh, passed quite readily through the legislature. So I think it's, you know, as with any one of these, uh, you know, a, a new uh, gubernatorial administration comes in, it takes a while for people to figure out how it's going to work. We're going to have some analysis of the legislative session on Arizona Week next. So I want to move back to a real estate question, Thelma. In Inside Tucson Business this week, you also have a story about rent prices um, as a concern in Tucson and Phoenix. What's going on there? An interesting story came out with the National Association of Realtors, and they put out some numbers about renting is just getting really high in Tucson, yet our incomes are not. And one stat that stood out is uh, income levels have dropped over the last year 3.5%, yet rent costs have gone up 11%. So something to watch for future 
future trends in that industry. Exactly. Thank you all for coming in. That's all we have time for this week. I appreciate that you took the time to come in. For more on this week's news, including stories that aired on NPR 89.1, find us online and on social media. Next, Arizona Week takes a look back at this year's legislative session from the perspective of political consultants and others who influence state lawmaking.